Hi, my name is Nick Borson. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and I have several videos here on YouTube talking about, uh, about learning to program in PowerShell. But today I'm going to talk about how if you know a little PowerShell, you can easily learn to program in C Sharp. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what they have in common, what these two languages have in common, and how they differ. And then we're going to go into a side-by-side -side comparison showing the same equivalent code in C sharp versus in PowerShell. So you can see how they, you know, how they're different and how they're similar. When I go into that, I'll, I'll first use a web-based C sharp tutorial that you can use to, um, to write some C sharp code right in your browser. And then we'll look at a, we'll create a C sharp project in Visual Studio. So first what they have in common is they're both built on .NET, which is a, uh, a uh, library, um, a library of classes and methods that you can use from your code and also a runtime environment that the programs that you write depend on. So they're both built on this, this technology, which is a uh, .NET is open source and cross-platform. It runs on Windows, uh, Mac, Linux, and so on. And the, uh, the link shown here on the slide is gives you a good introduction to .NET. And we'll also follow that link in a little bit when, when I do the uh, web-based C Sharp tutorial. Where they differ is that PowerShell is a scripting language and a scripting environment. Um, it's meant for uh, you know, being very interactive, being able to, to uh, simply write scripts and run them very easily. Uh, C Sharp is a compiled language, and that means that there's, a, there's an intermediate step between the source code you write and the thing you run. You have to first build or compile your code uh, into the thing you run. You don't just directly run your source code. If you use a compiled language then and you want to share your program with someone else, you don't give them your source code, you give them the, the executable program that you've compiled from that source code. That does make it typically more efficient and faster because the, the program has already been converted into a form that's um, more closer to what the actual computer hardware understands. They tend to be used for somewhat different things, although there is overlap. Well, today we'll just be, we're going to be writing a console program in C Sharp, which is very much the same as the sort of thing script that we can write in, in, um, in PowerShell. Although you can write all kinds of other things. You can write desktop applications, games, and so on in C Sharp, as well as web backends and various other things. So let's launch into our side-by-side -side comparison. So first I'm going to take a look at this uh, web-based tutorial. So this is the link that was in the slide, .net.microsoft.com, and it has various information about .net, what it is, and so on. But I'm going to click this Getting Started link here, and this has all kinds of learning material, but the one I'm going to go to is this C Sharp in-browser tutorial. Okay, so this is showing us a very simple C Sharp program, console.writeline hello world. This is your Standard hello world program that's kind of the first program you might write in any language. And this shows you how, how it is written in C Sharp. So we have console.writeline is a method. That is, writeline is the method that is implemented by the console class. And then we put parentheses around the arguments to the method. In this case, we're passing the string hello world. And then we have to follow the whole statement with a semicolon. We can run this right in the browser by clicking run code. And as you can see, it's compiled this in the cloud, and here's the output. As the next, so let's let's do the same thing in PowerShell. So in PowerShell, we could say write post hello world like so, and then if we say hello ps1, look from our prompt, we get hello world. So the same thing we'd have in in um, C sharp. Now I did mention that PowerShell and C Sharp are both based on .NET, and these are actually dot, this is actually a .NET class, and this is a method on that class. So we can actually, instead of calling write host, which is a PowerShell commandlet, we can actually directly call console.writeline if we want. So let's do that. This will make our PowerShell script even more similar. So PowerShell, we always put types in brackets, and then the double colon means that we're return, 
referring to a member of that type to console dot oops dot right colon right line hello world okay so this is the right house is more idiomatic this is more what you typically write in PowerShell but this is to show you that in fact we can call .NET methods directly from PowerShell, and it's really equivalent to what we're doing in the C Sharp. And if I run this script now, we get hello world. So the tutorial, the next thing it has us do is customize our code by changing world to, I'm going to change it to my name, Nick, and run it. I keep hitting Control S out of habit. OK, run it, and it says hello, Nick. And ditto for the PowerShell. I can change this to Nick. Terribly interesting, but here we go. Okay. So the next step, we introduce the concept of variables. So again, in PowerShell, we have the same thing. So let's click show me and it gets modified the code. So we have a variable called name, and we when we write the string, we build it up by saying hello plus name plus exclamation mark. And the result of this is hello Nick again because it's taken hello plus the variable name, which is Nick, and then plus exclamation park, and then we add all, all this together and you get hello Nick. And that's what actually gets written to the, to the console. So we can do the same thing in PowerShell. So, so name equals Nick. And then here we say hello plus name plus oops exclamation mark okay we we'll run this and we get hello nick so again almost exactly the same differences are minor differences in, in syntax here to introduce, introduce a variable we use the keyword var so name we know the name is a variable we know this identifier is a variable because because we declared it with a variable with the var prefix um, we don't need to have a dollar sign or some other prefix around that. This, this symbol is always going to be a variable. Here, we don't have a var keyword. Instead, anytime we have a variable, we have a dollar sign prefix, both when we, anywhere we refer to it. Otherwise, it's almost the same. We have a console type with that member, slightly different syntax, but pretty similar. Okay, let's go to the next step. String interpolation. So this is just a simplification of this. So instead of saying hello plus name plus exclamation mark, we can kind of insert name right into the variable by using this interpolation um, syntax. So one key thing in PowerShell, or excuse me, in C Sharp, is you have to insert have the dollar sign before the string. That means that the curly braces mean something special. The curly braces mean that there's an there's a placeholder inside that's going to be replaced with something else. You can do the same thing in PowerShell here by saying hello, dollar sign name, exclamation mark. In this case, we don't need the dollar sign before the string. This is sort of the default in PowerShell. It's always going to do this substitution. It recognizes because of the dollar sign that this is a variable, and so it's going to replace it with the actual value. And in both cases, we see here that the editor is kind of clever. The editor shows you with color coding that this is a not part of the string literal. It's green. It's part of a, it's a an expression that's going to be evaluated and substituted. And when we run it, then we get hello Nick. And here again, if we run this, we get hello Nick. Let's do the next step in the tutorial. Now it's showing us that we can call a method. So Nick is a, the, var, the name, the, or excuse me, the variable name is a string, and strings have methods. And you can call those methods by using the dot syntax. So let's modify our code, as they say. So instead of just saying name inside the braces, we say name dot two upper parentheses. So the dot means it's followed by, it's referring to a member. So name is a variable that refers to an object. The dot means we're going to refer to a member of that object. This thing to the right is the name of the member. And in this case, it's a method. The name, the member could be either a method or a property. Because it's a method, we have to include the parentheses. Oops. 
Okay, and then we run it and we again, and we get hello Nick, but now because we call it two upper, it's hello Nick in all caps. So we could do the same thing in PowerShell. Again, dollar sign name is a variable that refers to a string and strings have a two upper method. However, this isn't going to work exactly. This by itself isn't going to quite work. We'll, we'll, I'll show you the output. We get hello Nick dot two upper. Well, it hasn't interpreted dot two upper as being an expression. It's just treating it as a literal part of the string. That's because it's only recognized this piece as a variable, you know, as an expression to do this interpolation on, not this whole thing. To make it do the whole thing, we can say dollar sign parenthesis around this whole thing. Okay. And now everything inside these parentheses is an expression that PowerShell will evaluate. So it'll take the name, convert it to uppercase, and then insert it in, parentheses in place of this whole thing, and we get the capitalized name, like so. Okay, so you can see that the the uh, there's syntactic little differences in syntax, um, but there's a lot of commonality between them. So these tutorials go on. There's, there's, uh, I would, I would recommend. There's, there's multiple tutorials that take you into more advanced subjects. I'm not going to try and do a comprehensive overview of C Sharp, the language. That's way beyond the scope of what I'm talking about here. I just want to, sh wanted to show you how C Sharp and PowerShell are similar. But before I go, let me, let me exit out of the browser here, and I'm going to show you um, Visual Studio. So Visual Studio is you know if you actually want to write c-sharp programs on your on your computer then the easiest way to do it is to use visual studio this is different than visual studio code visual studio is a uh, development environment for windows that has um, uh, is very full featured supports debugging and it's it's easier in some ways than visual studio code it's the kind of the easiest way the reason I'm using it here is it's kind of the easiest way to create C-sharp projects. So <clears throat> here I've, uh, and, and by the way, it is, it is, there is a free version. Visual Studio Community is free and very capable. So, um, so here I've launched Visual Studio 2022 and I, I clicked new project. And now it's asking me what kind of project I want to create because Visual Studio supports creating lots of different kinds of programs in lots of different languages. So Visual Studio has the concept of templates. Um, so I could say, if I say all languages, all platforms, and all project types, we have you know lots of different kinds of programs we can create. But if we can filter this and say, I want to create a program in C Sharp, and you know I can create games, I can create desktop programs, I can create various things, and I create a console program. And then we have a template for creating a console program. Console basically just means something you run from the terminal. So I'm going to create a console program in C Sharp. I'll click Next. It asks me what I want to call it and where I want to put it. The default is it creates a source repos directory. Repos are like uh, in um, uh, there's something called Git, which is for managing your your uh, source code. So, and it creates repositories. So, so um, this will create a repo under the repos directory for our new program, a repository under the repos directory. Um, I'm going to call this uh, hello, hello console CS. And I'll click next. I'll accept the defaults here. And it has now created a project for me. So let me actually bring up my terminal window again. So here is the source repos directory. And if I cd into hello console cs, this is the directory that it's created for me. And we can see that there are um, three files in this directory. There's this sln file, a cs project file, and program.cs. Program.cs is the actual C -sharp source code. Um, a CS proj file is a C sharp project, and a solution file is a uh, SLN file is for uh, is a Visual Studio solution. So Visual Studio has this concept of projects and solutions, 
Um, a solution can contain multiple projects and a project can contain multiple source files. Um, but in this case, we're just going to have one file, one source file, um, but we can certainly add more. It's common in C-sharp to have a separate source file for each class, for example. So, um, but Visual Studio kind of manages all, all this for us by through its support for solutions. So anyway, we can uh, run this now by just clicking. So it's it's created kind of our Hello World pro program by default. I'm going to delete this comment, and I'll hit the, the kind of play button here to run it. So it's you notice that it said it was building, and then it shows the the output appears in a console window, and it says Hello World. Okay, we've already seen this, so I don't need to go into doing it into it again, except that now we've actually run it on our computer. And now, if I if I look here, there's a there's a bin directory we see. So if I go to the bin directory, let me just actually open a open a uh, file explorer. If I go into the bin directory, there's a debug directory. Uh, that there's a uh, .NET version six directory, and here is where it's actually put the executable program. Actually, it's created two things. It's created a DLL and an XE, and also a PDB. So it's created both of these. You can use either one. The DLL, you notice, is much smaller. This is a framework-dependent um, version of the program, and this is a standalone version of the program. And the difference is that um, if I go into the in So here we are. So the XE I can just run directly without any, it doesn't depend on anything else. All the all of the .NET stuff that it requires is baked right into the XE. That's why it's much bigger. The DLL really only contains my code. And so that's why it's much smaller. But uh, to run it, I have to say .NET uh, and, and then my DLL. And then it will, it will use .NET that I already have installed with my code um, in the DLL. DLL for on Windows is is a dynamic link library. It's a, a module that can be part of a program as opposed to a program that you can actually execute. So you can kind of do either one, um, but it builds both of them for you. Okay, so that's that aside. Let's get into a little bit more coding here. So let's say I want to um, write a function. So Let's go back into PowerShell for a second, and let's write a function that uh, takes computes the square root of a number. Okay, so to write that, we'd say function we'll call it square, and it takes a parameter which is the value we're going to take the square. We're going to did I say square root? I, I meant square. We're going to multiply the value by itself. And I can optionally use the optional use the return key weird here, but I don't have to in PowerShell. And then let's call this function by saying square 10. Okay. So now let's bring up our terminal window and we'll invoke our PowerShell script. And we get 100. 10 times 10. You know, it's passed 10 to as the parameter to the square, which is multiplied it by itself. And the result is the output of the function which is product 100. Okay, we can do the same thing now in C Sharp, but we do it a little bit differently. So to write the function, we don't use a function keyword. Instead, we start by writing the return type of the function. So in PowerShell, we don't really declare a return type. We just, whatever the, whatever the function writes as output is the value that it returns. Excuse me. In C Sharp, C Sharp is a bit more strongly typed. We have to declare what kind of object is going to be returned by the function. So I'm going to say that this is taking a double. It's going to take the square of a double. A double is, is a double precision floating point value. So I'm going to say double is the return type, and I'll call square, and I'll say the parameter is double. Um, let's call it value, and return value times value. Okay, so let's compare. Okay, let's go ahead and call this now. And we'll say console.whiteline square 10. 
Okay. So again, let's take another look at the PowerShell version so we can look at them side by side. So we don't have the function keyword. Instead, we have an explicit return type. And for the parameter, we actually have to declare the type that's passed in. So when we declare a function, we're actually saying this function only accepts certain kinds of values. We can't say square dog, right? Because that's a string. And notice the squigglies, it's going to say, cannot convert from string to double. Okay? So there is at compile time, there's the concept of type at compile time. Uh, or in, you know, before it even runs the program, it's, it, it, it already knows the type of certain things, um, even if you don't actually write it. It knows the type of certain things, and it's going to it's going to um, complain if the types do not match or can't be converted to what is expected in a certain case. And we wrote a function, we have to declare what kind of things it actually operates on. But when we run this, we see that we get the same output that we will in the, in the PowerShell version, which is 100. And again, if I, if, I hover over, if I hover over things a lot of times, we can see information about it. So Square, we've actually, it knows that um, uh, it takes a double and returns a double. Here, if I hover over the right line, we see that there are actually a whole bunch of different versions of right line. There are 17, there's this one plus 17 other overloads. So there's multiple functions with the same name, but different, kind, different parameters. So in this case, we're calling a right line that takes a double. How does it know that, it, that we want, it, want the version that takes a double? Because square returns a double. So it's figured out which one to call automatically. We evaluate square 10, gives us 100, and it passes the, uh, the, the value of 100 to console right line, which writes it to the console as a string. Okay, let's write something a little bit more complicated. Let's write a function that lists, um, lists files in, a, in the current directory. So we'll say, in this case, the function is just gonna write the files to the console, so it doesn't return a value. So we still have to declare a return value, but since it doesn't return anything, we use the keyword void. And we'll say enumerate files, and we'll call it. We'll, we'll say it's going to enumerate files in a particular directory, so we give the path of that directory. And uh, we'll, we'll use a, a method on the directory class, which is part of the .NET framework. Directory get files to a path. Sorry, dot, not colon, colon. And then this is, so here we uh, we have a get files method. If I hover over it, you can see that it takes a uh, path as a string and it returns an array of strings. And the description even tells you what it means. The return value is an array of the full names, including paths, for the files in the specified directory, or an empty, direct, empty array if no files are found. So we can, since we have an array, we can use the for each keyword. So let's go ahead and say generate files. Just get the files in the current directory. So the period is the current directory. Or we can uh, we can say um, directory get current directory dot I think that will just work. Let's see. Yes. So we've passed the current directory. It's going to it's going to um, get each of the file names in that directory. It iterates over this loop and outputs the file names to the console. Okay, and it's given us the full names. Now we could also just say dot. And in this case, when we run it. It's going to include the directory. The file names that it enumerates is going to include the directory, but it's it's a relative directory. It's just the dot that we passed in.
So how would we do that in PowerShell? Well, Now PowerShell has a commandlet just for this. We could say get child item or path. Oh, no, no, just, no, we'll see. So the path is and we want just the files. And we want to uh, put the name perhaps. Okay. So this is using a PowerShell commandlet that it, that is a PowerShell thing that give us files. And this is going to show, of course, we're in a different directory, so it's going to not show the same files as we did in the other one, but it gives the same idea. Um, now, if we want to do it, we can do it actually using the same concept here. We can say directory, directory, directory. We can use the .NET functions from PowerShell to do the same thing, get file. Get files. Uh, I think we might have to say so. Directory is in the system.io namespace. We might have to actually spell that out. System.io directory. Here we are. Get files. And now I should give us some telesets. Let's see if that works. There are path. Okay, so that gives us the files we see for each. In and let's actually say then console pipeline file. Okay, and this is really basically identical to what the C sharp code is doing. We see that even the keywords are very similar for each. They're a little different in a couple ways. So we, again, we have the for each keyword. In parentheses, we have variable name in expression. The right hand expression gives us a collection, and then this will, the loop will, the body of the loop will execute once for each item in the collection. And during the during that execution, the variable here takes the value of that particular item. So um, if we run this now. That's interesting. Why? Hmm. I'm a little curious why I did why it has outputted what it did there. Oops. <laughs> oh, this is the C sharp file. Let's, let me just app with the directory path and see, see what it thinks it is. Dot. Hmm. Confused by the how it's treating the dot in this case, but anyway. <clears throat> Evidently, PowerShell's current directory is not the process's current directory. Interesting. 
All right. Anyway, it, the it is um, you know the DAO is being interpreted relative to the current directory, and I'm, there seems to be a little bit of a mismatch between what I would expect here. But um, but if we pass the particular directory we're interested in, then um, uh, then it then it lists the files in that directory. Okay, so that's enough for that. Let's take something a little bit more interesting. So instead of enumerating the files, what if we want to, instead of writing the files to the console, what if we want this function to return uh, the a collection of strings? So of course we could just write directory.getFile. We could say just, I think, first of all, we have to say, um, let's just call it get files instead of So this actually returns an array of strings. So we can write a string get files, and we can just write oops. Okay. All right. So now we've declared a function instead of returning void or not returning anything. It returns an array of strings. So given a directory path, it's going to return, and then down here, we'll, we can say for each, OK, bear file. Switching back and forth sometimes this gets me confused. In get files, OK, to It's just listing those files. Of course, this isn't really doing anything. It's just returning what this fu other function already does. But let's say we want to build up our own collection of files. Instead of maybe just the file names, we want the the um, we want to convert these to full paths, right? So here, notice that when we run it, the file names are relative paths because that's what get files with directory get files returns. Let's say we want to convert those to something else. Well, instead of returning an array of strings, let's return a list of string. And I'll explain why in a minute. And we'll say list result. Okay. The autocomplete already knew, guessed that that was what that's going to want, so it's pretty smart. Um, we're going to return that result, and in between, we're going to build up our list. So for each file in directory files, um, first, just add this the way it is. We should see the same results we did last time. So. The list of the difference between a list of a list and an array is that list is a class that allows us to add things over time. So an array is, has a fixed size; you have to know it kind of up front. Whereas a list can grow by using add or insert or remove methods. So we take the list. We, and okay, the other thing is a list is a um, a class template. That's what these brackets are for. It's a, or it's a generic class. That's another word for it. So it's generic, meaning that um, we can create a list of integers or a list of strings. We can create a list of any type we want, and the type is, in, is specified um, in the angle brackets. So this is not just a list of anything. This is specifically a list of strings. And the, the value of that is that um, is that we know that the, we know that the thing like, when we put we can we, we know we can only put strings into the list we can't put integers into the list or or you know some other type of object and that means that whenever you get something out of the list you know a priori you know up front that it is a string oh, that list can only contain strings so there's that that means that that's statically typed you know the type of the object at you know um, 
without not just when the program is running by looking at the objects you know the type of the object up front just from looking at the code and the compiler knows the type of the object that allows it to generate more efficient code okay so um, so this will do the same thing that we got last time okay but now let's convert each of those to a um, to a full path so we can say um, I think there's a method directory that get full Hmm, what is So there's some other okay. <laughs> so this is a little different way of getting the files. So directory info. So instead of just passing a string to this helper method directory.getfiles, we create a directory info object from it. We call it getfiles method. And this doesn't return an array of strings, it returns an array of file info. So this, we can hover over the variable here, we can see that file is a file info. We can make that more clear by, we'll just say, instead of saying, call it file info. Okay. So then, file info dot full name. We go this should give us and now so we've taken so file info has type file info so we can't add it to an to a list of strings in fact when we try to do that it won't compile you can see that uh, well, let's see if we try to build this it should fail error argument want error on this line right here cannot convert from system io dot file info to string Okay, so this is how the typing, the variable types, um, are actually your friends. Some people sort of, when they are familiar with scripting languages or, or weakly typed languages, they sometimes get frustrated with, with um, more strongly typed languages because they feel like they're fighting with the type system. But the type system is really your friend. It's there to help as a, you can use the type system to protect yourself against errors, to make sure that you're doing your writing correct code by being explicit about what kinds of objects you're passing around. So in this case, we want to take the, the file info and get the full name out of it, which is one of the properties of the file info. And that's what we add to the list of strings. And then we know what we, what we get back is, is a list of strings. So if we run this now, then we get full names as our output. Okay, so the final thing I want to show you is, is um, debugging. So, so far I've just been running the program by hitting the play button, as it were. Um, but you can, also, you can also step through the program step by step, which is very helpful to when you're trying to figure out what's really going on, especially when things aren't going correctly or as you expect. So the debug menu has start debugging but it also has step into and step over um, uh, commands so and those all have keystrokes associated i'm just going to use f10 which is step over so if i hit f10 and now we see what now that we're, de we're, we're debugging and we we see that the um, the flow of execution is indicated by this arrow and by the highlight this is where the the program is flowing through your code and it starts out on this first top level statement at the beginning of the for each loop. Okay, so um, we have toolbar buttons for debugging here. We have step into, step over, and step out of, and we have stop and restart. So I'm gonna use uh, F10 to step over here. So F10 
So now the we've we've entered the um, the expression inside the for each loop. So this is this gets evaluated before we to to produce the collection that we're going to iterate over. So I'm going to step into this. This will step into our get files method or function. So I'm going to use f11 to step into this. And now we're at the opening curly brace of get files. So here we can see that um, this is where we are in the code. We can see down below here that um, we have local variables. This, this tab shows me, um, allows me to look at various things. We can see threads, locals, autos. Locals will show me all the local variables in the current function. And um, so we have a dir path, which is the parameter. And it's dot because that's what we passed to get files. And result is so far null because we haven't initialized it yet. And over here we have the call stack. So this is very useful as well. This is showing um, this is the, right. This is the the top of the stack is the function that we're currently in, and the next one down is the function that called it, and below that would be the function that called it, and so on. So here is the function just up the stack, which is the kind of the entry point of our program. Just the this is just top level code, and here is the function we're currently in. So we can step using F10. So now result is no longer null. Result is now a list that has count of zero and then we're in, we've entered into a for each loop so stepping again with f10 now we instantiate it instantiate a directory info and call its get files method and if I hit f10 now it's going to show me that that call has returned an array of system.io.file info so here's all the files that it returned and each of those is an object at type file info so each of those objects has properties as a directory, directory name, etc., full name, and so on. Lots of information that can be useful for whatever you want to do. Okay, so now I'm going to step again. Now we're beginning the first iteration of the loop, so our file info is going to be initialized to the first element of that collection. Now we're entering the body of the loop. So now file info is the object that's the first element of the array that was returned by get files. And now we're going to add its full name to the result. So now we step again and now we see result has a count of one. And if we expand it out we see that that is a string which is the first file. And step with F10 again. Now file info is being initialized to the second element of the collection and then we add that to the result and now result has a count of two and so on. So debugging is very helpful to be able to see what's going on inside your program. And uh, so that's, that kind of gives you a sense, both it, it also gives you a sense of understanding how, how the computer executes your program. Uh, so I'll say one more thing before I exit, and that is before I stop, and that is, I'm going to stop debugging here. Um, you can see that you have the different configurations here. There's debug and release. So if you're, most of the time, if you're, if you're uh, working with your program just to, you know, as you're developing your program, you most of the time want to be in, using the debug, debug configuration. And that's because it builds faster and also it's easier to, to debug. Um, it's easier to understand what's, what your program is doing when you're stepping through it in the debugger. The release configuration is for um, if you are building a kind of final version of the program that you're going to either use yourself or or share with other people, it'll produce a, uh, an executable file that's typically smaller. Um, it takes a little longer to build, but it'll produce a file that's smaller and that runs faster. Um, and it runs faster because it's it optimizes the program. So it uh, and that the optimization is what makes it harder to debug because it. It, um, it might take what you've written and rather than just sort of translating it literally, it, it figures out, oh, you know, if, if this variable is, um, you know, can be con combined with that variable or, or, you know, it can reorder things. As long as it can prove, as long as the optimizer can, can prove that the, the behavior is the same as the original code, it can kind of change your code in, in little ways to make it faster. So that's what, um, that's what, uh, 
debug versus release is. Okay, so I hope that that was instructive, and I hope you can see how C Sharp in many ways is very similar to PowerShell um, in that you know the things that they have in common are are written in much the same way, just slight syntax differences. Um, it is different in some ways. You know, there are, like I said, the syntax differences. You need semicolons. Um, you have to sometimes be more explicit about declaring types. Um, things generally are more strongly typed, but often these things can actually make it easier to write large programs because you have a better insight into what is going going on. And finally, if you're writing a large program, being able to debug through it um, can help you figure out where you've gone astray because you can actually see what the variables are and so on inside your program as it runs. So thank you for watching if you've gotten this far and I hope that uh, hope that you have fun with C sharp.